Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to give people a few seconds to log on and then we'll get going. Hey, everybody. Looks like we're expecting a good number of folks today. Did you say we had 60 signed up? That's the rumor. I think we might even be more than that. So we'll see how many people are out of a snowbank. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, my husband did the shoveling today, so I got out of having to even think about the snow. Hi, Next Wendy. Time. Awesome. Okay, well, uh, we're supposed to have 70 people and I'm just going to get started and people can trickle in. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Chamber Masterclass. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're thinking it's the last snow day uh, of this winter, maybe. It's hard to say. So thank you for joining us. My name is Becky Davison. I'm the Vice President of Marketing here at the Halifax Chamber and delighted to be your host today. Our Chambers Masterclass Series brings you expert topics uh, important to your business. And today we're talking about finding your customers online. So we're excited about that and thanks for joining us. We can all appreciate that it can be overwhelming doing business online. We know now that one size fits all approach isn't going to work for your business. But our presenter is here to help us navigate where we should be looking to reach our customers and how we should be marketing to them. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions for the presenter today. Um, we'll have the chat box open. Feel free to ask questions uh, and we'll get to those at the end. Um, and our presenter and guest speaker today, I'm, I'm delighted to introduce, is Caitlin Vorgoyne, founder and CEO of Customer Camp. Caitlin is a four time founder turned growth strategist and trainer. She understands the challenges business leaders face because she has been there herself. With operational experience spanning the marketing, tech, and hospitality sectors, Caitlin has been named as Influential Entrepreneur by Forbes Magazine and featured in Inc., HuffPost, Bustle, CBC, CTV, Global TV, and more. She is hella famous. Caitlin is recognized as one of the top 20 Wonder Women of SaaS marketing and growth. Caitlin's past clients include high-growth um, tech startups, SMBs, business support organization and fortune five comp fortune 500 companies like target and holiday Inn. totally cool. It's possible that Caitlin was one of my last normal coffee meetups prior to COVID-19 uh, coming to Nova Scotia. And I think the world of her, I will also encourage you all to follow Caitlin on Twitter. You'll not be disappointed in the free content she shares regularly that will stop your scrolling in its tracks and make you think about your business. Welcome Caitlin. And thank you for taking us through your workshop today. Thank you, Becky. That is such like an amazing introduction. And it's always so weird when you hear your own bio. <laughs> um, and it makes me sound way fancier than I am. And I'll get into like a little bit of my business journey and share some of my story with you. But today is all about you. And it's all about how can you find your dream customers online? So this next hour, it's going to be action packed. I'm not just going to show you kind of like what you should do. We're going to get into the weeds. I'm going to show you how a few tools that can make your life so much easier. And at the end, as Becky said, we can answer some of your questions and don't worry about taking a ton of notes because I'm happy to share this presentation deck with anybody who's here today. So you can sit back, relax and learn. So one thing I love to start out with is I want to know what motivated you to join today's workshop. So put your answer in the chat. I'd love to hear why people are here, what they're excited about learning, what's going on in their world that might make them want to learn about where their customers are online. So I'll wait for some of those answers to come in. I'll also apologize that my voice is a little raspy. Um, I think I'm about to get sick or <laughs> um, I've been losing my voice. So if things get a little raspy, I apologize. But post your answers in the chat. What motivated you to want to come today? I'd love to hear from you folks. Where are those potential customers hiding? Um, need to find out where your potential customers are. Great answers, yes. Um, anything going on in your business where it's like exciting right now that you're moving more online? That seems to be a trend that's happening with a lot of businesses. Starting to sell products online, Sarah says. Um, haven't seen as many online sales as Lindsay would like. That's common too. Um, wonderful things about this program. Awesome, Leah, thanks so much. How to convert your following to customers. Okay, so many good answers coming in right now. Online marketing when new to the market. Jay, that's a tricky one. Okay, let's dive into 
why you, you're sharing why, why you're here and you're absolutely in the right place. So this workshop is right for you. Maybe you've been at it for a while, marketing your business or working in a business, helping them to market, but you don't feel like you're getting the results that you really want to get. Maybe you are brand new to all things marketing and feeling totally overwhelmed and looking for some direction. If that's you, you're in the right place. And if you are trying to think about having to do all of the things online and you really want to figure out where to kind of focus, then this workshop is going to help. So Becky gave me a really great introduction, so I won't belabor it too much, but I will say that I have um, built this might even be a little bit of, out of date. I guess I would say that I've built four companies now. I'm also helping my husband with uh, his fifth. Um, and one of those we sold. So I started out with, off with a marketing consulting business, ended up building out a restaurant consulting business, which sold. And then I said, hey, I'm interested in trying to grow my business. And so I started adding more and more team members at my agency. We were working with awesome clients like Target and Holiday Inn. But I got this bright idea that maybe I should start a tech company because how hard could that be? As it turns out, very hard. So we this is the picture of my co-founder and I, the day that um, Inc. Magazine said we were building the next LinkedIn for women. That was an exciting day. Lots of celebrating happening at our office. And things looked really good from the front, but in the reality, my life looked a lot more like this. And I bet you a lot of you can relate to this. As entrepreneurs, we spend a lot of time trying to get into the yellow zone from the red zone. And ultimately our business did not become the next LinkedIn. That's why I'm here today, as opposed to like sitting on a beach, drinking a cocktail from a coconut. Um, but we did learn a lot, a lot of things that I'd like to share with you, some lessons, some hard earned um, life lessons. So I wanna take you into the yellow zone and out of the red zone. So here's my first lesson that I want you to stick with. You can do anything but you cannot do everything. So I know that you're all smart and you're talented. And if you had all the time in the world, you could figure out every single marketing channel and social media platform, but you are busy entrepreneurs. And chances are that time is actually your most precious resource. And so you can't do it all. You can't figure it all out. And if you try to be everywhere on the internet, on this big old internet, you're going to burn out trying to do that. So one of the biggest mistakes that I see a lot of business owners making, especially as they're just getting started in marketing, is they think they need to be everywhere. They think they need to be on all the different social media channels. They need to be growing an email list, running ads, um, doing promotions, hiring influencers, all the things. And they don't know what's going to work, so they try a little bit of everything. And because they're trying a little bit of everything, nothing works. And I don't want you to make that mistake. I want you to get clear on where your audience is hanging out so that you can get your message in front of them. So here's what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about identifying your dream customers. Because after all, how can you market to your dream customers if you don't know who you're actually looking to talk to? We're going to talk about figuring out where your dream customers are hanging out online. And part of that starts with understanding your customer's buying journey. So when they're considering looking for a product or a service like yours, how do they actually make their way through that buying journey? We're going to show you some tools that will help you locate your customer hangouts. And then we're gonna talk about choosing which marketing channels that you want to prioritize. So this is what we're gonna cover. Now, to make this all very tangible for you, I mentioned that my husband was running a new business that I was helping him with. Let's talk about that business. I'm gonna use it as an example and I'm gonna show you exactly what we did in when he, we started up that business that you can apply and steal the same techniques. All right, so this is my husband. Um, his name is Jason and he is a chef by trade, but he had been working for the last few years in the um, oil and gas sector. And when he lost his job because of the pandemic, there were no contracts available in oil and gas. He said, hey, I've been wanting to make a change in my life for a while. I want to get back into food. And so we started Charboys. At Charboys, we started out by delivering boxes of ready to grill barbecue meats and sides directly to our customers' doorsteps. So I like to say we were delivering happy food. And we launched Charboys at the beginning of June last year. And it was a wild ride, let me tell you. So the techniques that I'm going to share with you about finding our audience, these are the same ones that helped us to choose which marketing channels we should prioritize. 
that helps us to grow our audience um, to 4,000. I think that's actually, that number is not accurate anymore. It's more than that. But I think we're more like the 6,000 mark now across our primary channels, which for us are Instagram, Facebook, and email. Um, so we've been able to grow that audience fairly quickly. We've been able to identify promotional partners to collaborate with. So we've worked with amazing companies like the NSLC, Alexander Keats, and a number of different microbreweries around the province. We've identified media opportunities. So luckily for us, the media is always interested in sharing good news stories. And I think that Charboys has been featured in every major um, media outlet in Nova Scotia, including CTV, Global News, Raid the radio, most of the print publications. So pretty cool. And the big one that matters, we were actually able to sell out the first, um, within the first 48 hours with the first box we launched. So we didn't, and we didn't spend any money on advertising. So I wanna to talk to you about how we figured some of this out. So first you need to know who your dream customers are. If you can't figure that piece out, the rest of it's gonna be much, much harder. So let's talk about that. Now, when I say who they are, I do not mean that you need to literally know the names of the people that you want to sell to or the types of companies you'd like to work with. Um, that can be very helpful, but it's not necessary. But at a minimum, you need to know what kind of people your business is really best positioned to serve. So here are the questions you want to answer. What do your dream customers look like in terms of their behaviors, their um, demographic information, maybe where they're located, age, income, you know, what do they look like as people? Not physically, but in terms of like a broader understanding of who they are. What problems are they trying to solve? You know, most of the time when we go out and we buy a new product or we hire a service provider, it's because there's a problem or a pain point in our life that we want to overcome. What might trigger them to look for a new solution like yours? How do they go about looking for new solutions? Again, what is their buying journey like? What progress are they trying to make in their life that would lead them to try something new? What objections might stop them from buying from you? And what do they want the future to look like? These are the types of questions that if you can answer these about your audience, it's gonna give you a lot more clarity on who your dream customers might be. In marketing, we call this your target audience or maybe an ideal customer segment. So let's look at a couple of examples. If you are Lululemon, maybe your target customers are health conscious yogis and fitness enthusiasts. Now that said, since the pandemic, I feel like we all live in yoga pants. So Lululemon's market is probably a lot broader than it used to be. You know, but when they got started, it was really about those health conscious yoga people. And FreshBooks, FreshBooks is a cloud-based accounting tool and they service freelancers and consultants and small digital agencies. That's who they go after with their product. And then at Charboys, we're focused on food curious suburban parents in Nova Scotia. That's the audience we're going after. Now, just know that these high level descriptions of your audience, this is really a starting place. And if you wanna be successful with your marketing, you're gonna to have to go a lot deeper than these kind of like surface level descriptions. And so this is a snapshot of one of the customer personas we created at Charboys. As you can see, there's all sorts of information on here. And getting clear about who your target audience is and documenting that so the rest of your team understands and you can all be in the same place with your marketing, that's really important. And this is a mistake that I see a lot of companies make. They don't take the time to really figure out who their customers are or what matters to those customers to explore who those customers might be as individuals. And then they feel like they're kind of guessing when it comes to their marketing. So the truth is you could have the greatest product in the world, but if you're trying to sell it to the wrong people, you're just not going to hit your sales goals. And I see this all the time. So I posted this poll on Twitter. Uh, this was probably last year. And I asked other freelance marketers and copywriters, when you first start working with a new client, how often do they need help zeroing in on their right fit customer segments? As you can see, the answer was almost every time or more often than not. Now imagine as business owners, which many of you are, how annoying it is when you hire a marketer or a copywriter and you want them to get started right away on creating value in your business. You want them to generate sales for you immediately. But guess what? 
if you are clear about who your target audience is, then they need to start there and they need to do that foundational work first, which means it'll be slower when they start working with you to get to those outcomes. So it's really great as a business when you can do some of this work before hiring people to help you because they're going to be able to get value for you so much faster and you won't end up wasting any money. Um, so the other thing you want, need to know here is you can't just pick an audience at random, you need to understand why would that audience pick you back? So, you know, if we, if we could just pick our own audiences, we'd all say, I want to sell to people who have lots of money and love high-end experiences and will pay me really well. Well, that sounds fine, but why would those people want to work with you? You need to be able to answer that question too. And my absolute favorite method for answering that question is by doing one-on-one -on -one interviews with your actual customers. So I call these clarity calls and it's a really powerful technique to understand what motivates people to buy from you. Now we cannot dig into this today in this short workshop. I actually have a whole workshop I do all about this and I've created a resource called my clarity call cheat sheets. Now this is a paid resource that I have, but it walks through the whole process of how to do customer interviews to really understand your customer's buying journey. I'm going to drop a link to this in the chat so you guys can take a look at it if you're interested. But since we can't go deep into it today, what I will do is I'll give you a quick overview of how we did some of this at Charboys. So at Charboys, again, we started out as a ready to grill um, barbecue box. And at the time we were thinking our competition was like uh, other food boxes, like Good Food or HelloFresh, but we were specifically for barbecue. Now we weren't exactly sure who the best customers were when we first came up with the idea, but we had a hunch. So we identified three different target segments. So there would be maybe people who loved farmer's markets, right? Those people would care about buying local, which was a big piece of what we were trying to do. Or we thought maybe we're going after these convenience buyers, people with food box subscriptions, or maybe we're going after hardcore barbecue lovers. So what we were doing was we were thinking about um, each different type of buyer as a potential customer segment. Now we didn't know which one was gonna be the right fit for us. So we decided we'd go out and do customer interviews. So we talked to about 12 people. We did customer discovery calls or clarity calls, as I like to call them. And we started to learn some very interesting things about our buyers. And we started to see some very interesting patterns. So for instance, people who bought food box subscriptions, they hated how much waste there was. At first we were thinking, oh, we're gonna need to spend so much money on like branded packaging and like stickers and all of this stuff to make it feel really like professional, like some of the other food boxes. But we learned that customers actually hated that part of their food boxes. Um, they hated that, but they loved not having to think about what was for dinner. So they were willing to deal with some of the, um, some of the, up the garbage to not have to worry about doing knowing what's for dinner. So Armar is asking a question. He says, how do you do these calls? I mean, how do you choose the people to make the calls with? That's a great question, Omar. Um, we'll talk a bit more about that at the end. And a lot of those answers are in the cheat sheets. But essentially, you want to talk to people who have bought from you or who have bought from a competitor. Those are the best people. And if you can't talk to those people, then you want to talk to somebody who's currently looking for a new solution. So you want to focus on people who are actually in the buying journey or have bought, not some hypothetical perfect customer. But again, I'll do a lot more detail about that on the cheat sheets. Um, so more. So our customers at Charboys, barbecue was more than just dinner. It was a fun experience that they could share with their family and friends. And it was also their hobby. So they invested in like fancy spices and they spent money on a nice barbecue and they cared about this as something that they actually put their time and energy into. We learned that it was a very popular social activity among parents, especially parents who might have lived outside of the downtown core. So when you have kids and you want to get out for a night and enjoy some time with friends, but you don't have to pay for a babysitter or, you know, take a taxi downtown to a restaurant. It's nice to have people from the neighborhood over for a barbecue. And we learned that buying local was really important to a lot of our customers, but it was actually really hard to do consistently. 
So they wanted to buy local and they would occasionally go to like specialty butchers or grocers, but oftentimes because of the strains of, you know, busy life, they were buying the bulk of their food from places like Costco and Superstore. So these were some of the insights we learned about those customers. Now doing this research, that's what helped us to really narrow down and focus on these food conscious suburban parents. We knew that that was the target audience who based on what we were trying to do and their life and the progress they were trying to make seemed to be one of the best fits for us. And so this is what we use as a graphic on our first sales page ever. It's pretty obvious who we're going after with this, with this imagery, right? So when you understand who your ideal customers are and you take the time to really get to know what they're trying to achieve, you can really be where you where they are in their marketing. So I've got a little tool, I'm gonna to put a link to this as well. It will help you, this one's free. It'll help you to figure out who your best customers might be. It's called a customer ranking calculator. And essentially you can put in a number of different types of customers and make a guess at who you think your best fit customers are. And similar to what we did in the beginning with identifying those three audiences, you can try that same approach with this. So I put a link to that there, you can check that out. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about how to do the one-on-one -on -one discovery calls, then you definitely wanna check out the cheat sheets. Okay, so understanding your customer's buying journey. What do we actually care about as marketers, right? We care about moving customers through the buying journey faster. We want to take them from not knowing that we exist right through to gaining their trust and making their first purchase and becoming a loyal customer of ours. And interestingly, if you really think about the steps of a buying journey, they follow a very similar path. So it looks sort of like this. It starts out with a trigger event. That trigger event, it's the first moment where your customer realizes that they have a problem that they're looking to solve. And that triggers them to begin the buying journey. Typically then they'll begin like passively looking for a solution that might solve their problem. Usually a catalyst will happen, some type of event in their life where they'll go, oh no, this is too big of a problem. I really wanna solve this problem. Then they'll start actively looking for solutions to solve their problem. In the active looking stage, they're kind of like looking at different options, maybe asking friends for their opinion. Typically then something will happen that will push them into decision mode. So maybe one of the things that they've been looking at goes on sale, or maybe there's an event coming up that they need to make a purchase decision now and not later. They will buy the thing, they will use the thing, and they'll decide, hey, did this work for me? Did I get my job done? And if the answer is yes, then they're gonna be happy. They're gonna probably use your thing again and again. They're gonna tell their friends how great it was. And if the answer is no, then they're basically gonna fire the solution that they bought, whether that's a service that you offer or a product, and they're gonna start looking for something new to hire. So this is a typical buying journey. Okay, so thinking about your customers, where are they in their buying journey? Do you think that the, your customers already know that they have a problem and they're actually already looking for a solution like yours? If so, you want to get in front of them in the places where they're looking for solutions and you want to convince them that you're the best option. But maybe your customers don't even realize that they have a problem yet. Or maybe they know they have a problem, but they're not actually looking for a solution like yours. In that case, you might need to educate them on why they should solve the problem or reframe your offer so that it fits in to be a solution for the problem that they already know that they have. So let's look at this. Um, again, one of the best ways to understand your customer's problems and what leads them to you is through these one-on-one -on -one interviews. And it doesn't matter if you're selling luxury cars or accounting services or barbecue boxes like ours, I can guarantee you that there are some really interesting stories along your customer's buying journey that you can action in your marketing. Um, David's asking, how long does the buying journey take from trigger to buying? Does it depend? Absolutely depends, David. Oftentimes, you know, in some cases, somebody might, let's just say that you have an important meeting one day, you are starting to get hungry and you don't want to be a dud at the meeting and you're going through uh, at the gas station, filling up on gas. Maybe you grab a Snickers bar to satisfy your hunger, right? That buying journey didn't take very long. You felt the pain of hunger. You knew you wanted to, um, to have a little bit of energy for your meeting. So that's a very short buying journey. Whereas sometimes when it comes to something like 
buying a house or buying even a, like a new um, gadget for your home. Sometimes those buying journeys can take a really long time and your customer will try a bunch of different solutions before they find their way to you, even though the trigger might've happened for them a lot earlier. So it really depends. That's why it's so important to talk to your customers. So we learned at Charboys that our customers were going to the grocery store less often because of the pandemic. Remember, we started Charboys during the pandemic. And so we learned that there were some interesting things about that. They were going to the grocery store less often. People were nervous about being out more than they had to be. Um, and they were getting a lot more food delivered. So they were starting to build the habit of knowing food could get delivered. And people were cooking a lot more as a way to relieve stress. So food wasn't just sustenance, it was something they could look forward to and something they could experience and enjoy together at a time that was incredibly stressful for all of us. And we learned that they were eating more meals as a family. So one of the positive things that came out of COVID for families was that they weren't running around after school, um, trying to do all the after school activities and working late. They were actually sitting down for meals together more often. But they were not looking for a barbecue box. So I did a quick, uh, a quick search on Uber Suggest, which is a tool I'm gonna to show you in a moment. And as you can see, when you looked for barbecue meal kits, only 10 people were searching for that in all of Canada each month. So not a lot of people that we could serve who knew that we might be a solution to their problem. But in our interviews, we learned that there was another problem that they were trying to solve. And that one was way more exciting and interesting. So we learned that quarantine had led people to become very shack wacky. Um, everybody was stuck at home and they were looking for something fun to do to pass the time, something that would be fun, but also safe. And that was a huge insight for us. So rather than trying to find people who are looking to buy a barbecue meal kit and marketing about you know, how delicious our barbecue meal kit would be, we weren't gonna focus on that. Instead, we wanted to focus on people who were triggered at home, who were sitting there bored, looking for a fun experience that they could enjoy with their families. So we decided to partner with two other local brands. We worked with Boxing Rock Brewery and Big Cove Foods, and we hosted an event called Halifax's Big Barbecue Bash. It was a delicious virtual, virtual barbecue event. So we said it's an online event with real barbecue and beer delivered to your door. Again, the problem people had wasn't barbecue. The problem they had was boredom. They wanted something to experience with their friends and family. And so we hosted this event. We delivered all of the boxes. We had 100 people buy in the first 48 hours. And then we had these fun online experiences like a online beer tasting with Broxing Rock. We did a cooking class. Big Cove Foods did a cooking class. So it was really positioned as an event versus just a product. And it, looked, and it worked great, you know, it got our name out there, let us see that there was demand for a solution like ours. So in your case, you might be in on the side where people are actively looking for a solution like yours. And if that's the case, then you wanna prioritize being in the channels where you can be discovered, which we're gonna talk about more. But again, if people are not actively looking for a solution like yours, then you've gotta go out and you've gotta find them. And there are so many places where your customers could be hanging out. They could be in niche Facebook groups. They could be following influencers on Instagram. They could be listening to podcasts or reading industry blogs. So if you wanna figure out where they are, that's gonna help you to choose how to market to them more effectively. So let's move on to that. Finding your customer hangouts. All right, in the marketing world, these are called marketing channels. Channels, you know, is a fancy term, but essentially it's just like places where customers are hanging out and spending time. So simply put, a marketing channel is a place where you can get your product or service in front of a target customer. So Facebook is a marketing channel. Um, an email newsletter is a marketing channel. Um, Google, people Googling solutions and finding your website, that's a channel. Um, even review sites like TripAdvisor or Yelp, those are considered marketing channels. 
So here is a overview of some of the more popular types of marketing channels. And you can see the big obvious ones here that you already know, like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, but there's also some that might be as not as apparent to you, things like PR or social referrals. Social referrals is just a fancy word for word of mouth. And word of mouth is one of the most powerful marketing channels. Uh, in fact, consumers say that 77% of their purchase decisions are made because of word of mouth. So a really cool channel worth prioritizing. So if you're looking at this and you're going, holy crap, Caitlin, that is so overwhelming. Do not worry because you do not need to learn all of this. In fact, you often only really need to nail one or two channels in the beginning to start getting some momentum. So that might sound good. You're like, okay, whew, I only need to do one or two of these, but what ones, which one or two? Now, if you're not sure, then it's time to roll up your sleeves and start doing some research. And there are different methods and tools you can use to do this research. So first, you can simply ask your customers, right? If you already have customers, you can poll them or put out a survey, or maybe you just ask on social media and you say, where do you like to spend the most time online? So you're not gonna get as much details as you would in a one-on-one -on -one interview, but you will be able to gather some information that way. So next, you could look at some of your competitors. So let's say that you've got competitors who are serving the audience that you want to serve. Go and look at what where they're spending their time when it comes to marketing. Maybe they spend all their time on Instagram and they're basically inactive on Twitter. Maybe they're writing a blog, but they're not doing anything on YouTube. So getting a sense of what competitors are doing might give you an idea as to what's working and how they're finding ways to get in front of your audience. That said, a lot of the times your competitors are just copying their competitors. So it's always best to start with your customers as opposed to just blindly following the market. Next, you can do a quick Google search. So Google can be a researcher's absolute best friend. So again, in our case with Charboys, we knew that we were going after, you know, these food lovers who lived in Nova Scotia. And so I Googled food bloggers in Nova Scotia to try to get a sense of who some of the people were that they might be following. And I found an article on the coast. From there, I went through and looked at all the different bloggers, the top ones that were listed. And I explored where those bloggers were spending their time online, which social media channels were they most active on? How were they getting in front of their audience? Again, this can be a great way to see who already has your audience's attention. And now I'm gonna show you another neat tool called SparkToro. So SparkToro is a tool that allows you to explore where an audience might be hanging out. It's, uh, it's a paid tool, but you can actually do 10 searches for free each month. So I'm gonna show you how those searches work. All right, so with SparkToro, you can think of it almost like Google, but what you can do with SparkToro is instead of searching for, you know, show me websites that have to do with like food bloggers, you can actually search to see what audiences are talking about, what words they're using in their social profile, which websites they're visiting, which hashtags they're using, and you can narrow your search down to a specific location. So it's easier for me to show you than to just talk about it. So let's show you. All right, so here is my account. Now, as you can see, you just can write in the search bar, similar to Google. Let's say that I was interested in knowing who's talking about barbecue. And I want to search that. And SparkToro by default is going to show me everybody on the whole darn internet that's talking about barbecue. But I don't care about everybody on the internet because I can only sell to people based in Nova Scotia. So I'm going to put Nova Scotia. And I'm going to see some different results here. Now, watch this. There's some very interesting things that can come out of this. So SparkTor is starting to tell me who in Nova Scotia, based on the activities that they do online, is talking about barbecue. So it's going to pull up some answers here. Seems a little slow today. I don't know if that's my internet. Um, and Spark Toro, it basically scrolls the whole open web is what they say. So they look at all the different social media tools. They look at like blogs. They use a lot of different resources to find their data. But what they can come back with is they can give you some interesting insights. So the people who are talking about barbecue and who live in Nova Scotia, they often have Nova Scotia in their bio, that's not surprising. They're using hashtags like Halifax, Nova Scotia, Dartmouth. 
Now, what are they following on social accounts? Let's see who they follow online. That can help us figure out maybe some partnerships that we could use, or maybe if we want to pay for some advertising, we could look at who they're paying attention to. So Sydney Morning Herald looks like um, a larger percent of people who talk about barbecue happen to live in Sydney, so that's good to know. Um, uh, Charcuterie Ratno, that's another um, business that a friend of ours actually owns that. So you can see here, these are some of the social accounts that they follow. And Getaway Farmers, guess where we get most of our product from? We get it from Getaway. Why? Because we know that that's a brand that our audience already trusts. So you can scroll through and you can see a bit of information. Again, with a free search, you can't go super deep. You have to pay to go deeper, but let's look at some other stuff. Let's look at some audience insights. So what phrases are they currently using and like where might they be located? So again, a good portion of them are located in Halifax, then in Sydney, which is interesting. You know, if you're thinking about, for us, we started out just being in Halifax and then we're looking at where's a secondary market in the province. Well, this is helpful, right? It tells you that there's people in that area that are really interested in uh, barbecue, whereas other areas, not so much. Um, where are they spending their time online? You know, it looks like Facebook and Instagram are their top ones. Um, because of the way Sparktoral works, it uses Twitter, uh, like a big portion of how it gets its data is from Twitter. So Twitter's always kind of like shown as a larger percentage. Um, let's see, anything else here that might be interesting for us? Uh, websites, what websites are they spending time on? So they're going on CTV, right? Well, guess what? We've been in CTV twice. So you can know, does it make sense for us to prioritize trying to get some press coverage? Doing a little bit of this research can help. They're reading the coast. They're reading the Chronicle Herald. We've been in the Chronicle Herald as well. Um, they are looking at Facebook, no surprise. You know, a lot of people are on Facebook. So as you can see, a Spark Toro search can help you to start getting a sense of who your audience is. Now, if you already have a large following yourself, so I have a fairly significant Facebook following, or sorry, Twitter following. So I'm gonna put in my Twitter account and I'm gonna search. And then if you already have a social audience, well, now you can look at your own audience specifically. So let's see what comes up for me. So who other, what other social people are people following? So these are some of the other accounts that people who follow me also cover. And guess what's cool about this? So I launched a podcast last year. And by looking at who my audience was already following, I knew exactly who I should invite to be a guest on my podcast. So I had hidden Shaw on the podcast. I've had Brand Fishkin on the podcast. April Dunford's been on the podcast. And so knowing who my audience is also following gives me a good idea about how I can get in front of people that might be interested in the type of content that I post because they're the same people that my audience is interested in. So again, really great way to get clarity around where you might want to spend some time online. All right, let's move on to another cool tool. So again, SparkToro, great for doing free searches. You can do up to 10 searches a month. I would recommend doing a little bit of Googling and get, kind of getting some clarity on what you think your audience might care about and what brands you think they might follow before you use SparkToro. Because once you, you know, you only have those 10 searches, it'd be nice to be able to save them and, you know, make sure that you're uh, checking the right things. Oh, I wanted to show you one more search on here. Another account we knew because we'd done our pre-research um that our audience might be interested in is the Halifax Noise account. Um, they have a large following across a number of different channels. And if you look at their account, you can see again, what are some of the other publications or accounts where people who like Halifax Noise are also spending their time? What makes those people unique? So again, doing a little bit of pre-research will help you to make the best out of your SparkToro, um, SparkToro content. All right, so going back to here. So you've done a Spark Toro search, that's handy. Now let's look at doing using a second tool called Facebook Audience Insights. So if you have a Facebook page for your business, then you can log in to Facebook Audience Insights. Now you don't just need to look at your own page. I'm gonna show you how you can do a much broader search, but let's take a look. So Facebook Audience Insights, 
Again, Facebook, similar to SparkToro, is able to give you all sorts of information about an audience. Now it's all anonymous, so you don't actually see your specific customers and their answers, but you can see kind of like a more general and broad thing. So again, like for this tool, you'd like, it works best if you have a fairly large audience you can analyze. The Charboys Facebook page is, I think we've got 2000 or so uh, followers at this point. So it's not a huge page. So rather than just looking at our page, I might actually look at just everybody on the internet. And I'm going to start narrowing it down. I'm going to say Halifax is where we're interested. Hel not Halifax, Queenland. Halifax, Nova Scotia. So I'm going to look at people who live in Halifax. Or maybe I'll say Nova Scotia. I'll make that more open. So Nova Scotia. Okay. And maybe I know that there's not a lot of 18 year olds buying our boxes. Maybe I'll start with the age range of like 28 up to like 60. And maybe I'll look at their interests, right? So this is what makes uh, Facebook audience insights interesting. If you know a little bit about your audience, you can put in information and you'll start to, and it'll start to give you some interesting answers. So let's say that I wanna know people who care about barbecue, right? Let's put that in there. And we also learned about our customers. We knew that they liked craft beer. So let's put that in there. So we're narrowing this audience down a little bit more so we can get kind of more specific information about them. And let's say that we're looking at people who are parents, because we know that that's an audience for us that tended to be. All right, so what I've done here is I've narrowed down the search and I'm gonna show you some interesting things. So this is showing you of everybody who lives in Nova Scotia, who falls in this age range, who has these interests. It's starting to give us some interesting information about them. So it's telling us, it'll tell them a little bit about the, in, the industries that they work in. Now, this isn't particularly useful to us at Charboys, but it's, you know, it, it, depending on what your business is about, it could be useful for you. Now, what pages do they like that they're following, right? So this is interesting. So it's telling us that they're following Vines Pasta and Grill, Micmac Bar and Tavern, Old School Donuts. Well, guess what? Jason's going to be partnering with Old School Donuts and using their products in one of our boxes. Again, we know that the audience is hanging out there. It's a good opportunity to take advantage of a partnership that can get us in front of them. We've used Two Boys Smokehouse and Deli before. So let's just scroll down a little bit more. Again, like Nine Locks Brewing, Brenton Brewing. We knew that our audience was interested in uh, craft beer. So as you scroll down, you can see all sorts of other businesses that your audience is interested in or other organizations that your audience might be interested in. This can inspire you when it comes to partnerships and it can inspire you to say, well, those businesses that my audience is already interested in, how do they market themselves? Are they all, again, are they all kind of like focused on one particular channel? They're really focused on Instagram or they're blogging or they're doing podcasts. It can help you to kind of get some clarity around where brands that your audience is already interested in, where they're spending their time. And activity, this, this isn't very useful for what we're doing, um, but location, it can kind of show us where these people tend to gather. So Lunenburg, that's where our hometown is. There's a good number of people in Lunenburg that are interested in barbecue and craft beer. Halifax, obviously the dominant market, makes sense we're in a big city. And they can show us again, some secondary markets. If we're looking to expand and not just offer services in Halifax, it can be useful to see where people that are interested in aligned things are hanging out. So some good information here. Um, Omar is asking, how do you log into the audience insights? Um, I'm just gonna pop a link in the uh, chat here. And basically you go to this website and you go to go to audience insights and it's gonna ask you to log into your own Facebook account. And then you can start using audience insights. All right, so um, going back to our presentation. So Facebook audience insights, again, a really neat tool. So now let's say these are tools where you, when you don't really know where your audience is hanging out, these are the methods you can use that are gonna help you to get some sense as to where they're spending their time. But if you do know that people are actively looking for a solution like yours, then I'm gonna show you some other ways to get in front of them. So let's say that people are actively looking for your solution every day. People are out there looking for whatever it is that you sell. Then you want to focus on helping those people to find you. That's where you want to spend your time. 
And so one way to do that is by doing a little bit of keyword research. So keyword research, um, basically if people are searching Google or other search engines for solutions like yours or products and services like yours, you wanna get a sense of how they're searching. Now there are two ways that you can get your, your product or service in front of people on Google. You can buy your way in to getting in front of them, meaning you pay for ads, or you can earn your way into getting in front of them, meaning your website ranks in Google. And I'll talk a little bit about both of those. So search engine marketing means paying to get in front of your audience on Google. Now, if you Google meal kits in Nova Scotia, guess what? The very first four results that come up are all ads from brands that are trying to get in front of an audience searching for that result. So those people have paid to get in front of people that are searching for that result. That's what's known as search engine marketing. Excuse me for one second. <coughs> now, if your audience keeps scrolling down the page, they're gonna see which websites are ranking for those keywords organically, meaning that they have did, like optimized their website so that when people search for meal kits in Nova Scotia, their website comes up first. And you can see that there are several results that show up there. Again, this is called SEO. SEO means that you've designed your website in such a way and you've written content on your website so that when Google goes out and scrolls the whole internet, they find your website and say, this is the best answer for, for this question. Now, SEO or search engine marketing, or sorry, search engine optimization, it is not a quick fix. So if you're looking for something to drive traffic to your site right away, it's something that you need to invest in. It takes time to get working. Um, most, if you hire an SEO expert to help you with it, typically it can take between three to six months or even longer until you start seeing results from those efforts. So it's not a quick fix, but it's absolutely worth doing for, because the long-term benefits of SEO can be huge. So the question you wanna ask yourself is similar to we did at Charboys, like, are people even looking for solutions like yours? How do you know? Well, you can use a tool like Ubersuggest, which is a free keyword research tool. Again, similar to SparkToro, you can do a certain number of searches for free, and then you have to pay to use the tool. So I'm gonna show you just a couple of searches to how this works. I've already logged in and I'll drop a link to um, Ubersuggest in the, in the chat here so people can go and check it out. But I'm already logged in. So I go to keyword analyzer and I'm gonna to go to keyword overview. And I'm gonna search for, let's say barbecue box. I'm gonna search in all of Canada. All right, so looks like since we did that original search last year and with the summer coming on, things are heating up a little bit. There's at least, there's more searches happening in Canada, 220 happening in Canada. Um, every month. This tells me the SEO difficulty, which means if I wanted to rank organically for those keywords, barbecue box, how hard would that be? Well, it's 49 out of 100. So not easy, not super hard either. So it's, you know, it's about midway difficulty. It's going to be competitive. What if I just want to speed up the process and pay? Well, if I want to pay, it's actually going to be pretty difficult. So you can see here that there's a lot of competition for those keywords. There's lots of big players in the space companies like um, Good Foods and um, HelloFresh. They'll drop a lot of money to compete for the, the, those keywords. And so you can see that it's difficult to compete. 100 out of 100 can't be more difficult than that. And the cost per click, meaning if I want to pay to get in front of people that are making that search, it's going to be about 50 cents a click. So, to, you know, this is again all of Canada. We don't serve all of Canada. Probably not worth it for us to compete on these keywords. But we know that one of the reasons that people would often buy our barbecue box is because they're entertaining, they want to have a fun time with friends. And so we can think about, well, what other things might they be searching for that maybe would be an easier way for us to rank in Google? So, one thing that we do as kind of like a sideline to the business is Jason does some private chef stuff. So let's put in private chef plus Halifax. Let's see, did I spell Halifax right? It looks like it, yeah. So what about if we tried to rank for these keywords? 
okay, well now we're talking. So there's not a lot of search, but it's specific to Halifax. So it's gonna be more relevant to us than the one that was for all of Canada. The SEO difficulty, this is considered easy. So it wouldn't be as much work if we wanted to work with an SEO expert or learn to do the SEO optimization work ourselves, wouldn't be as difficult. The paid difficulty, easy of seven out of a hundred, cost per click zero. That means that there's probably nobody else running ads right now to those keywords. And if we were to run ads to those keywords, we could get those clicks for very cheap. So again, a good way for us to explore, should we spend some time on SEO? For the term barbecue box, probably not. For getting Jason some attention for his private chef stuff, absolutely. So the reason I share this tool with you is why go out and spend a bunch of money or hiring somebody when you're not sure yet if, SE, if um, search engines are even the right approach for you. This allows you to do just enough research yourself to know if it's worth talking to a professional. All right, so going back to um, going back to the presentation, it may be worth testing search engines ads to see how they perform in your business. Again, for us at Charboys, it's not a big priority for us right now. However, for other types of businesses, it could be really well worth the investment. So my mom runs a tour company in Lunenburg called Seaweed Tours, and she does daily 45 minute tours and wine and beer tours. Now, when I searched on Uber Suggest to see if maybe it would be interesting for her to look at that channel, as you can see here, I searched for things to do in Lunenburg or what to do in Lunenburg. Those tend to be search results, um, search terms that people use when they're visiting Lunenburg. Well, lots of people are searching for that every month, almost 600 people. And it looks as though not a lot of uh, competition on paid. So $0, the paid competition, very low. So for my mom, it might make great sense for her to spend to get an ad in front of people that are searching for things to do in Lunenburg. All right. So we've talked about these different ways of finding where your customers are hanging out online. We talked about asking them. We talked about doing competitive research, seeing where your competitors are spending their time. We talked about doing a quick Google search or using tools like SparkToro, Facebook Audience Insights, or doing some keyword research with a free tool like Ubersuggest. So you have an idea now about where your audiences might be hanging out online. But as I said before, you're probably gonna see that there's a good number of different ways that people are getting in front of your target customers. It'll give you some sense as to what's working, but you're still gonna see a variety. So let's talk about how you now choose which channels you want to prioritize. Again, you can't do all the things, you wanna figure out where you should spend your time. So again, it's helpful to think about the different types of channels. So there are paid channels, that might be in paying per click, like with, face, with uh, Google ads or Facebook ads. It might be um, paid social media ads. It might be paying influencers to share your product with their audience. These are what are known as paid channels. Then there are the channels that you own. Channels that you own are channels like your website, your blog, your social profiles, although you don't truly own those, um, your email list, um, your personal, your brand's uh, social pages. So those are kind of channels that you own. And then there are channels that you are considered earned channels. So that could be reviews from happy customers. It could be media coverage, like being on the news. It could be guest posting on somebody else's blog or YouTube channel or social media. It could be getting your customers to share that they love you like on their feeds on social media, or it could be influencers sharing your product for free with their audience. So you're not paying them. So when you think about it this way, it's like, where should I spend my time? Well, it depends. And there's trade-offs that you can make at each stage. So if you want to get your message out through the paid channels, it's going to be fast. That's the benefit, but it's going to cost you money. So if you don't have a very big marketing budget, that may not be the right approach for you out of the gate. If you want to build an audience on channels that you own, that's a really good long-term solution and it's going to drive a lot of long-term value, but it will be more labor intensive in the beginning because you're going to have to be patient. It's going to take time to build up that following. It's going to take time to get people reading your blog consistently or signing up for your newsletter. So really good long-term value, but labor intensive from the beginning. And then if you want to earn your audience's attention by focusing on channels where you can get 
free publicity, like getting press coverage or getting reviews from your happy customers. Those are really persuasive channels, really, really successful in getting customers to take action, but they're not reliable. You know, you can't be guaranteed that the media is going to want to cover your story. You can't force your customers to write reviews about you. So highly persuasive, but reliable. So really, as you're deciding, you want to ask yourself, what are the trade-offs that you are willing to make in your business, right? Do you need things to be fast? If so, maybe paid is the right approach for you. Are you willing to take the time and know that it's gonna be a bit slower and grow an audience that you own? It's, it's really about assessing which trade-offs you wanna make. And here's an important part for you to consider as you're making these decisions. You want to be having fun, right? So as you're doing your marketing, you're, it's, it is going to take some time. It's going to be an investment of your time. And if you want to be successful with it, you'll need to be consistent. But if you're having fun, you're going to be a lot more successful. So showing up online and marketing your business consistently, it can feel like hard work, but it's going to be more fun if you enjoy the process. So keep that in consideration too, as you choose your channels. So for instance, if you love to write, then maybe for you, blogging would be fun or starting an email newsletter be fun. Twitter or LinkedIn, those are channels that really give value to written content. So maybe those are the right channels for you. For instance, I love Twitter because I love writing short form copy, but I hate Hate writing long form blog posts. It takes me forever. So what I like about Twitter is I'm constrained to 280 characters. That's why it's the channel I'm most active on. Um, and maybe you're highly artistic and you would then thrive on more visual channels like Instagram or TikTok, or maybe you're going to love making video ads for your business. So if that's you, then you might want to focus on the channels that allow you to flex those artistic skills. Maybe you love teaching or being on camera. And maybe that means that one of the best ways for you to get out there would be to focus on creating how-to guides or blog posts or video tutorials or webinars to share your message with your, mark, with your audience. So again, maybe that's the best solution for you. Or maybe you're just a natural people person and you just want to connect with like-minded people. And maybe that means that you spend your time networking. So you're going to live industry events, you're hanging out in online groups like uh, Facebook groups or LinkedIn groups or specific forums, interacting with other people and building up your business one person at a time. And that might be the right fit for you. So looking again at our Charboys example, we knew because we were doing so much research with our customers, we knew our customers wanted to learn new cooking techniques and they wanted to try new recipes. Now, with that insight, we could have said, hey, well, we should start a blog. You know, lots of chefs have a blog. Um, however, we, uh, my husband is not somebody who really loves writing. He's not super techie. I wouldn't see him wanting to update a blog all the time and learning all of the ins and outs of SEO to try to get the blog so that there'd be consistent traffic. That wasn't really a focus that he was going to do. However, he is a natural entertainer and he's an extrovert. He loves interacting with people and making them laugh. So we decided instead we'd focus on channels that would lend to his strengths. And so we're focused on, um, on Instagram and Facebook. They're both channels that allow you to be visual. We host a live cooking class called Meat School that we do every Friday. That's an important channel for us. We've built a great and loyal fan base by doing that channel. Over time, once we got a little bit more, um, you know, more ahead on things, we started really focusing on collaborations and press. So that for us are really important channels. We partner with breweries for every box that we launch. We've tried working with influencers, just trying different things and getting a sense which collaborations are going to work. And again, using audience research to figure out who we should collaborate with. We send a email and we build our email and we work on building our email newsletter. So that's a channel for us. And eventually one thing we would like to add when we have the reason, the capacity is we want to do some video cooking tutorials. So that's not something we have yet, but it's something we're working on. So again, you don't need to master all the channels for us. We really spend the bulk of our time on Facebook and Instagram, and we are very active there interacting with other brands that we might want to do collaborations with. And that's where most of our time goes. The other stuff, given that Jason's married to a marketer, I can help him with some of that. If he was doing this on his own, chances are we wouldn't be looking at launching a YouTube channel. We might not be growing the email list as quickly because he, he can't do all the things. So those are the ones for us. So again, if you know what your audience is interested in 
and what type of content you actually enjoy creating, it's going to be a lot easier for you to show up consistently. So let's wrap things up with three major takeaways. Um, the three main takeaways from today is that if you want to find your dream customers online, first, you need to know who your dream customers are. That's the starting place for any marketing strategy. And again, if you're, if you're not clear about who those customers are, then that's the foundational work that you should do first. The customer ranking calculator might be a helpful tool for you. Um, you only need to really nail one or two channels in the beginning. I've seen people build very successful six and seven figure businesses that are focused on just really one channel. Like maybe they do almost everything on Instagram or they do almost everything on Facebook or they're new, they have a paid newsletter that's huge for them. You don't need to do all the things. You really don't. And it's going to be way easier to be successful if you are having fun. So make sure that when you consider where you're going to invest your time, that you think about your preferences as well and the type of marketing that you are most excited about learning how to do because you're going to be able to be a lot more consistent with it if you have fun. All right, so that is it for me. We'll open things up to Q&A. I'd love to hear from everyone what they thought about today's class. So pop your answers in the chat. Um, it looks like there's a question there from Heather already, so we can get started with that. And I'm also just gonna drop a link again to the customer ranking calculator. Cause again, if you're at that stage where you're not quite sure who your customers are, then this can be a nice tool for you. So I'm dropping that link there. And I'm gonna go back and take a look at the question that, um, that Heather asked. So she said, re-influencers. That's exactly how I heard of Char Boys. I actually didn't know it was your business, but I've definitely heard of them from seeing influencers open and unbox theirs. Awesome. Oh, wonderful, Heather. Well, that's so nice to hear. Um, which influencers in specific? If you if you remember who you saw it with, let me know. Because it's always good to know where people are finding out about you. Um, some feedback, excellent advice. Um, where will you be able to see your presentation again for reference? Um, Zoe, I don't think that the presentation itself um, in the recorded method will be up online, but I will send this deck to the Halifax Chamber and I will make sure that they email out the deck to everyone who shared. So this presentation, I don't think I, it's, it lives online anywhere and that's kind of by design because I like to be able to make it fresh for audiences the first time I do it, but I'll make sure you have a, the presentation deck so you don't lose any information. Um, Kara O'Coin, oh, awesome. I will let Kara say, I will say thank you. Kara has been such a great customer. Lots of great tools. Heather, she works at Saltwire, create a custom, um, when we create custom articles for clients as a marketer, what's the best thing you can say to potential new client to sell them the power of content marketing? Ooh, good question, Heather. Um, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to understanding, first of all, what that client's goals are. So what progress are they trying to make? And there's a really great, um, there's a really great book all about this called Demand Side Sales. I actually know the team at Saltwire and I've talked to, to Mark a little bit about this, um, but there's a really great book written by a gentleman called Bob Moest and it's called Demand Side Sales. And it's about how to use one-on-one -on -one conversations with customers, again, interviews, falling back on that nerdy interview stuff and use that to really understand the progress that your customers are trying to make so that you can have the right marketing messages for them. So if they wanna understand the power and potential of content marketing, it's gonna be somewhat dependent on what types of goals they have in their business. Of course, everybody wants to grow their business. That's kind of at a high level, um, a message that's gonna matter, but like more specifically for those types of clients, it's gonna depend. There's gonna be different reasons why they wanna grow their business. So maybe they're trying to bring something new to market and that's why they'd be interested in content marketing. Or maybe they are trying to stay top of mind with, uh, with their customers and bring their best customers back in the door. That might be another answer. So really kind of getting clarity growing their business is kind of that high level answer, but to really get a sense of what their specific answers are. You wanna, you wanna talk to those uh, types of customers and learn a bit more. So uh, let's see here. Meredith, how do you manage several customers who are at differing points in their journeys? Um, that's a great question. Um, so Mary Beth, it, it depends. Um, one of the most unsatisfying and most true answers in marketing is it depends. So if you, if you are talking to marketers who give you blanket responses, oftentimes those might be out of context and not true. So the answer is it depends, but 
it, I guess the question becomes, where if, if, is there a trend or a pattern around how your best customers find you and around how they tend to make decisions? And if you learn through talking to customers, through customer surveys, that there is this pattern, this trend, then you can figure out where you might want to spend more time so you can move them more quickly through the buying journey. As I said, you know, as a, as a blanket truth, Word of mouth is one of the absolute most powerful ways of getting the work, like, you know, just helping people discover your brand, but then also of convincing people it's worth trying. So anything you can do to get happy customers sharing, whether that's sharing on social media, whether that's writing reviews for you on different platforms where people might go to find out information about your business, all of that can be a really, really good way to help people to move through those different points in their in their um in their journey so uh bernadette thanks uh, becky for posting the calculator again um barb needs to run thank you barb um okay so lindsay asks um youtuber finding his engagement and growth is plateauing any tips i do, i'm not an expert on youtube by any means i would say that what i what i know to be true of every platform is that the algorithms are always changing and youtube in particular has had to make some fairly significant changes because the way that their algorithm was designed before was perpetuating like kind of like misinformation and conspiracy theories so they've made some big tweaks to their algorithm um and that may be part of the reason why your husband's seeing a change right now. What I would say is that the, you know, each social platform rewards engagement. So if you, if he can create content that again is like the type of content people are searching for, then more people are going to discover him that way. And then within his content, making sure he gives people a reason to ask questions in the comments or to like and subscribe or to share like any behavior that's going to show YouTube, this is valuable content that viewers are getting value from like is going to help him to continue to grow. So the algorithms are always changing, you know, the keywords or the descriptions that will work will change over time. But what always is gonna work on those platforms is seeing true engagement from people who are interested in the content. So anything you can do to, to, to level that up. Um, so what are some of the trends uh, you've noticed in online marketing since the pandemic. Um, one of the interesting trends is similar to what uh, we did in the beginning with Charboys, which is people trying to take a, what had, would typically be a live experience, like a, an in-person event and find a way to deliver that in a virtual environment in a way that's still really engaging. And so that's been a really cool trend to watch. Um, another trend I would say is that obviously people are shopping way more online and their shopping behaviors are changing and so brands that historically didn't think they needed to be active online maybe weren't offering an online store people could buy their products maybe weren't offering things like um curbside pickup or call in orders there's been a big shift in, sh in sh shopping behavior so those brands the ones that react quickly um, are the ones that are going to seem the most success there's actually a really good podcast from uh, a friend of mine over at Shopify, Kristen LaFrance. Uh, she has a podcast called Resilient Retail. And it's a Shopify podcast and it's all about how traditional businesses that have been affected by the pandemic can stay resilient and how they can transition into what's going to be the future. And that podcast shares so many great stories, really inspiring with founders of businesses that are making a transition. And again, it's our customers, they like interacting with them in person. Eventually life's gonna go back to normal and it's going to be, you know, it's gonna change things back and things are gonna be progressing and more like they used to be. But I think some of the behaviors we developed are here for life. And so that, you know, it's important for brands to look at how can I involve my business and the way I serve and connect with customers now that their behaviors have changed. Um, Susan, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing. And I also interviewed uh, Kristen on my podcast. I'll find a link to that um, customer show. And she went all, and it was an awesome interview. She's so great. And we went into uh, 
how to adapt to new customer expectations. So here's a, here's a link to that. So question, how can businesses regain customers? Uh, again, unsatisfying, but very true answer is it depends. It de like looking at why, how your customers behaviors might have changed and how you fit into them. So again, looking at this idea of understanding your customer's buying journey and understanding why customers might choose you. One thing that happened with uh, the pandemic is we did move a lot of events online, but I think a lot of people, there's this term that's come up in kind of pop culture called being zoomed out. And uh, the reality is that there's a different energy and goals that happen in, with a um, in-person an in-person event than what happened online. You know, when you go to an in-person event, you're there because you want to network. Maybe you are going to a conference in a, in a city where you want to have a vacation. So you're looking to write some of it off. Maybe you're there looking to connect with the prospective client or looking for talent that you want to hire in your company. So even though you might go to a conference because there's going to be great speakers, you can't just create the exact same like speakers and put them online and expect people to have that same experience. So what I would say is look at the real reasons why people are choosing you and why they work with you in an, in a real in the inward um, real world capacity and then think about are we delivering on that, that same expectation online and if not what, what we, how might we be able to adjust what we do to do that better? Um, I'm not sure if that's a good answer to the question, but really it comes down to looking at what were we doing before, understanding why your customers cared and what, how that helped them, how that helped them make progress, and then brainstorming, well, how can we recreate some of that magic in an online environment? Um, Francis asks, what are our recommended channels to use for a service company with B2B customers and how to use those effectively? Um, Francis, it, it depends. <laughs> Again, like very unsatisfying answer. But there, I think the one thing I would say is that oftentimes people think about, you know, they think about B2B is LinkedIn and blog posts and B2C is Instagram and TikTok. And what I'll say to you is that it, if your audience, it really, the question is, where is your audience spending their time? What motivates them? What excites them? I think a lot of B2B marketing could be a lot more fun and interesting than, than it is. So looking at who, maybe you, sometimes you can take inspiration from your competitors, but then you can also look at brands that serve a similar audience to you and maybe aren't direct competitors and say, what are they doing that's so interesting and engaging? So um, I'm just so glad that you've all come and joined today and participate in this talk. Uh, I think that we're going to wrap things up because we're at time. And thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Awesome. Um, I think, can people hear me? Caitlin, can you hear me? I can hear you, yep. Uh, I'm going to assume people can hear me. Great. Um, so thank you so much. I loved that. Um, I made my own analogy. One of the things that stuck with me uh, today was, um, you know, pick a few channels and go go hard with those channels. And that if you're doing SEO, it's not a quick fix. So that was really enlightening for me too. Um, I'm thinking about it like my partner likes to garden. So he grows his own tomatoes and I go to the market because I'm not patient enough. So you have to pick which route you want to go down. So I appreciated that and all your um, informa information for our members. So thanks again, Caitlin. Your company is Customer Camp, can help you delve deeper and uh, even deeper into the world of digital marketing. So I encourage all of you attendees today to reach out to Caitlin. Um, she's got some great tools and, and information that can help you grow your business. So uh, and want to thank everyone for attending today. We have uh, we're talking about something maybe slightly less sexy next week, but still important taxes with H&R Block next Tuesday uh, on CRA's new form still equally important for your business. And we also have our 2021 Halifax Business Awards tickets are free for this. We're really excited. The team's been working really hard. It's going to be a great production. So uh, that's free. You can sign up on all of our events at halifaxchamber.com slash events. Uh, as mentioned, we recorded this video, so it'll be on our YouTube channel very shortly. Uh, and again, Caitlin, thank you so much for partnering with us on this. And everyone have a great day and please stay safe today. See you Thanks, later. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.